On today's show, which prospects do NHL teams tend to value? We'll look at who they value, who they overvalue, what type of prospects we're talking about, and give you examples all on today's show. You are Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On this podcast, we bring on everything prospects related for you five days a week, Monday to Friday. I'm Hattie Kalakash with Sebastian High, both directors of scouting at Dauber Prospects. And on today's show, we'll be breaking down which which prospects NHL teams tend to value. So we'll first look at the, at the in the first two segments, we'll look at the prospects that they do value, um, things like big physical defensemen, those kinds of things, talk to you through why they value them, why they tend to project them higher than, than public scouting, for example. Um, and also look at kind of some examples of each type of archetype of prospect and how they've turned out since their draft year. Um, that's the first two segments. And in the final segment, we'll also look at the uh, prospects that tend to overvalue, overlook, um, and see why that is, give you examples as well, and talk you through how they've projected, how they've progressed so far since their draft years in those specific examples cases. Uh, before we get into any of that, though, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe. Leave us a comment letting us know what you think of the episode uh, and what you want us to talk about next. And if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, as usual, please leave us a rate and review and make sure to make us your first listen of the day. Um, so let's start with a couple profiles here in our first segment of uh, types of players that NHL teams tend to value more than average. Um, and let's start with the one I mentioned in the start of the episode, big physical defensemen. Uh, that tends to come up a lot uh, and they tend to be valued a lot higher than they are in public spheres. Talk me through um, kind of what type of profile we're talking about here, what type of what type of things these types of prospects do really well, and why NHL teams value that so much. For sure. I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to just the style of the modern day NHL playoffs. And a lot of this tendency has to do with NHL teams drafting players whose archetypes are succeeding at the NHL in the most competitive environments today, rather than necessarily looking ahead at the next like five, 10 years and seeing which archetypes are developing and becoming increasingly important at the moment. And big physical defenseman is something that has always been valued at a pretty high level uh, among NHL circles. But we saw that especially at this past draft with Carter Yakimchuk going seventh overall to the Ottawa Senators. What he brings to the table is a six foot three frame, a desire to hit anything that moves, and uh, he embodies aggression, where he has the puck on his stick and is trying to dangle through an entire opposition defense, or he's playing defense and he's looking to crush opponents that are coming onto his side of the ice. And it leads to mistakes being made, uh, it, it, it leads to him. Um, completely overcommitting to certain hits, leading to odd man rushes against his team. Uh, but it is a profile that teams really like him being able to combine his high-end offensive skill, whether it be the can of a shot or the high-end uh, handling ability, with that, that more physical defensive presence and maybe being able to uh, develop into an offensive specialist who is still able to create a lot of space defensively and clear the net front, clear the slot of any uh, potential threats back there. But we've definitely seen this mold of big physical defensemen be drafted pretty high, pretty consistently. That said, Anton Salayev dropping to 10th overall rather than going top three is also an indication of, of teams uh, definitely having other filters apart from just size and physicality when they are assessing draft eligible prospects specifically. Absolutely. We'll get into uh, another another type of uh, player that um, another type of, I'd say, region that's undervalued as well, uh, which uh, which we've added to the list of undersized uh, of undervalued rather um, prospects by the NHL. Um, but yeah, overall, I think that the thing with big physical defensemen is, like you mentioned, the playoff format, um, the way that NHL playoffs, at least in the modern day, are played. Um, we've had recent examples with teams like Vegas and um, and and uh, St. Louis and Washington playing big physical defense, um, leading them to success in the uh, in the NHL playoffs. So teams, the NHL is a copycat league. When an NHL team wins the uh, wins the Stanley Cup uh, with a certain mold of of game with a certain identity, uh, whether that's at forward or at defense. A lot of teams jump jump on the back uh, on the bandwagon and start kind of copying that style. Um, I think that's a big reason why big physical defensemen are valued by the NHL. Um, another example, another couple of examples I give. For example, Oliver Bonk, who was drafted in the first round uh, a couple drafts ago, 
he's, I mean, he's a big physical defenseman. He's not necessarily an offensive burner. He's not a type of player that I would really trust entirely with the puck, but he can blast the puck from the blue line. Uh, he plays physical. He's mobile. He's rangy. Um, you know, getting picked up in the first round by the Philadelphia Flyers was a reach that I didn't see them going for, and they did. Uh, and it makes sense based on what NHL teams tend to value. Other examples recently, David Reinbacher, uh, fifth overall to the Montreal Canadiens uh, in the 2023 NHL draft. There's a decent amount of examples like these. Uh, the one player I thought was going to go in the first round that didn't, Dominic Bedinka this past draft, uh, slipped mm-hmm. to 34th overall to the, um, to the Carolina Hurricanes. And the Hurricanes aren't a team that necessarily fully is is on board with the idea of big physical defensemen um but they went for dominic bedinka and i think that's a good compromise for them because they've got a lot of these really skilled really smart really undersized players um that they've added in recent drafts especially at forward um so adding bedinka on defense makes a lot of sense for them uh and one thing i'd also add Mm -hmm. though with the big physical defenseman uh portion here of the first segment is that it's one of the the, the rare molds of, uh, of of hockey players and prospects where the actual underpinning of composure and intelligence is not weighted nearly as heavily as it is in other profiles. Yeah. If, for instance, you are an undersized, high motor, energy winger, if you don't have that that foundation of intelligence and refined habits, you are written off almost completely. Whereas if you are a big physical defenseman that is almost more optional in, in terms yeah. of evaluation as, as a category. Like we, we saw that with the Ottawa Senators also uh, in the second round going out and picking Gabriel Eliasson, who uh, is massive. He is punishing. He is violent. He is mobile. Uh, he's six foot seven, right? He's this hulking, hulking player on the blue line, but there is a complete lack of composure and, uh, and, and calculation in how he approaches the game of hockey. But Otto was still very willing to take on that project because of his high-end raw physical tools and are hoping that uh, the, the the hockey IQ portions of, of the equation are able to mature with time, whereas that, that, that trust in that area of the game developing is often a lot more lacking uh, for different profiles of players. Oh, for sure. Um, that brings us to our next uh, valued prospect by the NHL or, or valued profile of prospects, and that's the shoot first power forward. We have multiple, multiple examples of these. Ryan Leonard, Cutter Gauthier, uh, in previous draft years, we're looking at prospects like Yuri Slavkovsky, who was, I would say is a shoot first power forward, but was shooting a lot, uh, especially yeah. in international tournaments. At um, the Olympics, the seven goals in seven games was what uh, p- pigeonholed him in as a shoot first guy on, on many he boards. He fooled every single scout uh, into thinking he's a shoot first power forward. He's a playmaker. Uh, but yeah, just so there's some multiple examples of these, especially seemingly from the NTDP. Um, you know, the likes of, you yeah. know, Cole Eisenman just recently, um, there, there's decent value there. I want to say that Cole Eisenman was overvalued, but he was certainly, I'd say in contention for each team in the 12 to 20 selection. I'm sure he was their second or third guy on the board. Uh, the Islanders went for him after all, but yeah, I think the shoot first power forward specifically, um, have a lot of value in the NHL. I'm thinking as well of Casper Haltonen, who was drafted by the San Jose Sharks. He's a great example of a prospect who, um, and I think the main thing with these guys is they develop well, usually. Um, they, they, they tend to add to their toolkit. They tend to add to their skill set, uh, round out their awareness or intelligence or decision-making in most cases. There's always the outliers, the examples like Josh Anderson, who I don't think ever added to his to his awareness or intelligence. I think he's, he's been thinking the same game since he was 18, um, but in most cases, uh, you look at Carter Goche, he's become a lot more intelligent, a lot more composed. Same for Ryan Leonard. He's really stood out on most games. He's the best player on Boston college, including a team that had Will Smith. Um, yeah. you know, these and guys, they, yeah, I mean, these, these guys add to their toolkits. They add to their skill sets. They round out their games. I think that's what NHL teams look for historically is look at the past, see who's developed properly and draft similarly. Right. And I think that that's. It's not just the size. It's not just the strength and the power with which they play. It's also what they tend to do after the draft years, uh, as I think I'm in standout with you guys. But that's our first segment done. Uh, we'll look into our second segment here, where we look at three different profiles of prospects that the NHL team uh, that, that NHL teams tend to value. Uh, we'll get to that in just a second. But just before, a quick word from our sponsors at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. 
eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers to roof racks to LED headlights, exhaust kits, and far more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you're always going to find exactly what it is that you are looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, which is available to U.S. customers only, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Alrighty, so we've got three more profiles of prospects that NHL teams tend to value. I'll look at that here in this second segment. So first and foremost, we'll start with right shots. Right shots have been valued as long as I can remember in NHL drafts. Uh, whether that's on defense, at forward, it seems like every single team's looking to add some right shots to their roster. And it's, it's especially prevalent on D, I would say. Definitely, definitely, when you're looking at defensemen, being a right shot D gives you more value than it being a left shot D. Uh, that's where it's, I'd say it's the most obvious. But it's also obvious as forward, as we just saw uh, a month ago at the NHL draft, when the Anaheim Ducks selected Beckett Seneca third overall. Um, it was mainly because, and everyone was talking about it, they need a right shot forward. If you look at their forward core, Mason McTavish, uh, Leo Carlson, Trevor Zegras, Troy Terry, the list goes on and on and on. They don't have bona fide top six right shot forward. And they saw that in Seneca and went for it. I, I think it's a third overall. For me personally, it's a reach. I love Beckett, Beckett Seneca. I had him in my top 10 at the end of the draft year. But uh, that's still a third overall. It gives you an indication that right shot forwards are are starting to get even more valued, especially for teams that really need them. But let's focus back on the right shot Ds because I think that's where the standout is the most massive, right? Like I can go as as far back as twenty years ago and still name you that argument as like, oh, this is a four, this is a defense we need because he's a big right shot D, right? For sure. I mean, it, it's a it's a rare commodity uh, at the NHL level. So the the promising prospects that have that quality are always valued accordingly uh, because NHL teams are always looking to add some more quality down the right side of the defensive core. And with most coaches uh, league wide still favoring defensemen on their strong sides, uh, whereas we've seen a lot more, I guess, fluidity with uh, with, with, with forwards and, and shooting uh, in terms of many more modern coaches also really quite liking players, uh, a, a wingers. Uh, from their weak sides in terms of being bigger shooting threats and being able to access the middle a bit more easily uh, to get dangerous scoring opportunities. But on defense, apart from when you're lining up in the offensive zone and perhaps switching positions there in order to also bring that that inside driven shooting threat mentality to the equation, coaches still love having defensemen on their strong sides, being able to shut down the boards uh, and, and be a lot less vulnerable to, be, to being beaten wide. Um, but uh, yeah, it's clearly something that, that's still very valued today. And especially when players are able to combine that right shot with a big physical frame, they are going to go high on draft day. And we saw that, that in this draft class as well. Like apart from Dominic Badinka, every single rangy like right shot defenseman that was anywhere near the conversation of going in the first round did uh yeah. and, and there's a good reason for that and the dink it was also nabbed up two picks after uh day two just begun so uh carolina did not waste any time there in securing their guy but uh yeah it's definitely a profile that has been really valued and we've also been seeing this with like trades in the nhl recently uh, like even going back just like two years to the Jeff Petrie trade where Montreal sent him to Pittsburgh the first time around, uh, he got a big return with Mike Matheson there because even though Matheson was like well uh, over half a decade younger and more and more mobile and just had put up his best ever offensive season, he was a couple inches shorter and a left shot and Petrie had almost the exact same value as a result of that, even though they were very different areas or stages of their respective careers at that, at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And you can look back at the draft and see, you know, uh, David Reinbacher that we just mentioned, Oliver Bonk that we just mentioned, both right shot for both right shot defensemen. And this just past draft, uh, Adam Yerchek and Artem Levshinov going second overall. Um, and with Yerchek going, what, what was it? 14th? Uh, uh, them, 16th, I believe, to St. Louis. Something like that. Um, regardless, those are two right shot Ds that went fairly high compared to where others had them ranked. Um, Levshinov yeah, going second overall. 
Yakumchuk as well is a perfect example of that as well. Just right shots have been valued for the longest time. Uh, let's move on to our other um, kind of valued uh, archetype of prospect in the NHL circles. Playing center in your draft year, even if you don't project as a center, tends to bump you up rankings. And I'm just thinking of, you know, you look back at previous drafts at like guys who played at center who weren't, who don't really project as well at center. Most of them went high. Uh, whereas if you're a winger, even if you project really well as a center, even if you're more intelligent than most centers in your draft year, uh, you played wing, so you're a winger, we draft you later. I'm thinking of Liam Greentree recently, um, you know, these types of prospects who I think project better as centers. TJ Ginla as well is in that conversation. There's examples, a lot of them, of players who project better at center, but because they played wing, they're not as valued as highly, whereas the opposite is also true. If you played center in your draft year, even though you're not necessarily defensively aware or intelligent or that kind of stuff, you tend to be valued a lot higher um, in your draft year, right? For sure. I, I think a great example of that um, it would be with the Ottawa 67s from, from the 2023 draft class, where Brad Gardner, who was a very middling forward at the OHL level, but played center all season long, went in the third round, whereas Luca Pinelli, who was an offensive dynamo for that team, but was completely inhibited from playing a, a pivot role that entire year. And as a, as a D plus one, he only played center because that's where he is at his best. Uh, but because in his, in his actual draft year, he didn't play there whatsoever. He fell it down to the fourth round, despite projecting better defensively off puck in terms of intelligence, in terms of offensive tools, in terms of dynamism, whatever you might be looking for, Pinelli beat out Brad Gardner. And for anyone that watched a lot of the 67s in that draft class, it was a confounding uh, reality that Gardner was projected to go higher all season long and did end up go higher than Luca Pinelli because the gap between those two players is a large one uh, yeah. and it is not in that direction. Um, and uh, as a D plus one, it would look exactly like that where Brad Gardner still remained a fine middle six center at the OHL level. And Luca Pinelli scored over 50 goals as a first line center in the yep. OHL. So uh, playing center in your draft year plays a very big role and often doesn't reflect what the players are actually able to bring to the table. And uh, like, we're also going to see that with Tija Ginla now as a D plus one, he will be playing at, at, at the center role uh, there in Kelowna, probably going to be the one C in Kelowna. We'll see what he's able to do with that role. Uh, I'm very excited to, to, to see what he has in store, but if he'd played center this, this season, he likely would have gone top five, top four, uh, maybe yeah. pushed out Caden Lindstrom from that spot, uh, especially with the injury concerns. So uh, we'll see what happens there, but uh, definitely playing center, it plays a massive role in the draft year, but, for the final part of this segment, let's, let's move uh, uh, our, 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 our perspective a little bit over to Europe. Because we've mainly been focusing on some North American-based players here so far, but playing professional-level hockey in Europe is a massive boost. And conversely, playing junior hockey in Europe and being restricted away from the pro level is a real minus in terms of draft stock. So uh, what organizations that have these players with them in their systems what they choose to do with their development plays a very big role in where these players end up going and where they're able to show yeah. off their toolkits. Absolutely. I think that the main standout for me is regarding um, the, the recent value that's been added to playing pro, for example, in Switzerland, playing pro in Czechia and Slovakia. That's grown a lot in terms of what NHL teams tend to value there. And I think that that's a, it's a good thing at the same time, because, you know, I think looking back, David Reinbacher played some fantastic hockey in Switzerland with a team that didn't really, you know, it wasn't Zug, it wasn't, you know, um, you know, it wasn't Zurich, it was Cloten. And this year, this past season, we saw a lot of what Cloten actually is with David Reinbacher in that situation. Um, but still, the ability to scale your game up, play physical hockey, and and keep up with pros with genuine like twenty five to thirty five year olds um, in in the in the pro system, regardless of whether that's in Switzerland, Sweden, Finland, you name it. That's a big part of what makes players um, players valued, especially in Europe. I'd say that, you know, there's still some contingency. Like, you know, this past draft year, Jet Luchenko going ahead of Kansa Hellenius, I didn't think that made too much sense. Um, you know, that, that was, I'd say, one example of uh, teams valuing, well, at least one team valuing, you know, the the 
pro translatable, you know, full time top six forward in in a pro league in Europe, valuing him less than a junior player in Jet Luchenko, right? But apart from that, most of the time you look at the prospects who are playing pro, um, and they're going in the top end of the draft. I'm thinking of Igor Chernyshov uh, as a potential counter example. Um, he played decent amounts in the KHL. Emil Hamming still, I believe, was a first rounder. Um, yes. So like. There's decent value here if we're looking at the past draft, but if, even, even if we look further up than that, like the, the example for Reinbacher is, I think, perfect to describe. Like, this is something that teams value. Playing pro at a young age, Uri Slavkovsky, perfect example as well. Playing pro at a young age is extremely valued. Um, and uh, yeah, overall, I think that's, a, that's something that NHL teams definitely tend to value. But that's our second segment done. We'll look at our third segment here where we finally look at the undervalued prospects, prospects who I would say that teams. Um, kind of overlook at times or see as less worthy of a, of a high-end pick. We'll get into that in just a second, but just before, a quick word from our sponsors at Game Time. If you're looking to buy cheap tickets last minute to any event, Game Time is the best place to secure them. Game Time is safe, secure, and affordable. Uh, and you can get tickets last minute to any event, and sometimes even an hour after the event starts, you can still get tickets over at Game Time. And they're obsessed with saving you money. They've got flash deals, zone deals, uh, last minute deals, and their Game Time guarantee makes sure that you always get the best price. If you find a ticket in the same section and row for less than what Game Time has to offer you on their website, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference on your tickets. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL at checkout for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply, but again, super simple. Just create an account, use code Locked On NHL at checkout for twenty dollars off your first purchase. So download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Alrighty, so let's close things off here with the prospects that teams seem to undervalue, and I think we can start with the easy one here and the pacey, undersized playmaker. And we've got. Thousands upon thousands of examples of these, the most recent of which being Luke Misa going in the fifth round to the Calgary Flames. Um, I don't think Luke Misa should have left the second round. I think that this was a bona fide second round prospect. I had my concerns at the end of the year regarding whether or not he'd be worth a first round pick. And I think a lot of it has to do with his his tendency to just speed everything up rather than be able to slow down the play and kind of um, kind of widen the play, play East West hockey a bit better. But He's, there's still enough value there to make him kind of a middle six defensive winger or center. Like there's there's decent value here. It's just he's small, he's pacey, um, and he's he's very much playmaking oriented. He's not a shoot first type of forward, which I think that's another part of why this kind of profile player is undervalued, right? For sure. And I think like, like the example I wanted to bring up in this section, also from this from this draft class, would be Teddy Stiga, a player yep. who by all accounts, outperformed a guy like Cole Eiserman this season. He played better, more consistent hockey than Cole Eiserman did. He had a stronger U18 World Championships than Cole Eiserman did. And he was a consistent cog in the wheel of offensive production at the at the NTDP this entire season long. And uh, that said, he's five foot ten, uh, very pacey, very intense, great off puck player, good checking winger, uh, creative force on puck, really good playmaker, solid puck handler. On top of that, a lot of quality in his game. He also scored a bunch of goals this season, um, more than than the the pacey playmaker uh, profile usually does at this level. Uh, but still, he ended up falling to the second round to the Nashville Predators. And he's a player that became a lock for the both of us in the first round uh, by March or April. Like It wasn't too, too late in the draft cycle that he'd entrenched himself in that, in, in that range. And that was even before the U18 World Championships kicked off. So uh, he's, he's a player that I think... Um, definitely is a good candidate for for this type of, of, of profile being undervalued. And uh, I, I'd be curious to see if, if he hits fully, uh, does this profile maybe get a bit of a boost moving forward, especially when they're coming out of like the NTDP specifically? Yeah, and I don't think this just applies to like the outliers, the, the outside chance of being a first round type of prospects. And it doesn't even apply. If, I'm, we're not talking about five foot seven forwards. Like that's obviously going to be something that teams undervalue. We're talking it's not about the Max Swansons of the world here. Yeah, right? we're, we're talking about the 5'11", 5'10 guys who like aren't are, are one inch away from being six foot, right? Like, yeah. Berkeley Cannon for me this past draft was a perfect example of that. My concerns were less about size, but I know for a fact NHL teams did not like the size with Berkeley Cannon. Yeah. And he went eighth overall, I believe, to the to the to the Seattle Kraken. Yeah. Um, and 
that, I mean, I felt like he could contend with the Lindstroms and the Aguilas in the top end of the top 10, right? Um, but he ended up going at eighth overall there to Seattle. And I think that's a great selection for them. It's a great fit worth trying to build. Um, and yeah, I feel like NHL teams could find more value in those spacey undersized guys. I, I understand the argument of not wanting a full team of sub six foot players. Historically, that doesn't, that doesn't win you cups. But if you can find two or three, four max, like key sub six foot forwards on your top six on, on your on your top, uh, on, well, uh, just in your lineup in general, I think that that's pretty useful uh, to have in your lineup. Um, that brings us to the other portion of that um, on defense, which is the quote unquote undersized puck moving D. Um, and I say quote unquote undersized because one of the examples I have to this is, is Zeev Buyam, who's six foot and a half. Um, like he's, he's not small by any means. It's like, he, he's, he's six foot and a half. Like we're, we're good on that end, but because of the style that he plays, um, he doesn't play overly physically. He plays a lot more with his brain, uses a lot more of his feet and his, and his mind to, to create and to suppress chances. I don't think teams value that as much for me. If you contrast Carter Yakumchuk with Zeev Buyam in terms of defensive ability, Zeev Buyam is acres ahead of Carter Yakumchuk in terms of defensive ability. But because Yakumchuk's aggressive, he's physical, uh, he's in your face, you can't miss him uh, defensively, people look at Zeev Buyam and go, oh, well, he's obviously the less defensively skilled guy. But that's just absolutely not the case. Uh, and I think that this is a market that NHL teams should start investing in. And I don't think Zeev Buyam is just the start of that. I mean, Aaron Kiviharu went in the fifth round. Lane Hudson went 62nd overall. Like... There are examples upon examples upon examples of this, right? Absolutely. And I think going back to that that, that Carter Yakumchuk example, uh, like oftentimes when you're looking or the, the first defensive players that, that you see are the ones that are incredibly hard to miss. The problem with many of them is that it's easy for them to miss you as well. Yeah. Like with, with Carter Yakumchuk, when when you make him miss you, you are set. You are you are you have a clear lane in on goal. Yeah. Um, and, and with the Z Booyams of the world who are a lot more calculated in those, uh, in those aggressive pushes, uh, to, to close gaps, uh, you don't really get past them. You are, can try to get around them, try to, to, to use your reach and your strength to out muscle and, uh, and get pucks like through them or around them. But, but they don't just like, uh, become obstacles that you can just make one quick move to get around and then you're set, which is the yeah. case with many of these hyper aggressive physical defensemen who have not really learned that 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 strong foundation underlying their habits and their defensive involvements 100 percent. no i fully agree and and that's for me i value zeev william a lot higher than i do with carter yakumchuk in terms of what he brings to the game on all that but i wasn't surprised at all to see yakumchuk picked ahead of him uh it's just you know it's perfect i think those two are the perfect example of what teams value versus don't value um at the nhl level uh, and Minnesota is just, they just got away with murder there with picking him up at 12th overall. That's, that's absurd. It makes no sense. And, uh, yeah, please give me, uh, Brock Faber and Zeev Buyam on a top pair forever and ever, please. And thank you. Please. Uh, yeah, we'll move on to goaltenders. Cause this is also an issue with goalies. The intelligent undersized goalie gets overlooked massively. And there are again, multiple examples of this. UC Saros in this draft year. Uh, I believe it went in like the late third, early fourth round, even yeah. though he was putting up insane numbers in his draft year. Um, and more recently, Devin Levi, seventh round, Dustin Wolf, seventh round, enough said. Uh, that's, I think, the perfect example of yeah. goaltenders being uh, overlooked because of their lack of size. And a lot of teams are on record saying, we won't draft a goalie who's under six foot two. Um, if you're a six foot six goalie, even though your technique is subpar, even though your puck tracking, your awareness, your intelligence, your decision making, your uh, puck playing ability, regardless of all that being subpar, doesn't matter. You're six six. A, a team's going to try to pick you and mold you into an NHL goaltender, and most of the time, it doesn't really work out that well. I'm thinking back to the Montreal Canadiens being really, really high on Joe Verbetic, for example, who just mm. he's an ECHLer right now. Um, it, it's not it's not a winning formula, let's say. Um, and the last last group I really wanted to mention was Russians. And I think yeah, historically, that's an easy one, I would say, in terms of, of undervalued markets among prospects in the NHL. Like, how many examples do we have of Russians being picked way below where they should go solely because they're Russian? Nikita Kucherov <laughs> being <laughs> like, like a third round pick. That's um, I, I mean, I mean, it, it's gotten less egregious over the last decade, I, I will say. 
but yeah. it's still clear. I mean, Ivan Demidov on talent was a second overall selection in this draft class. Uh, going back to last year, Matt Day Mishkov should not have been around at seventh overall when Philadelphia was able to pick him. Um, even even going into more like depth Russian players, we've been seeing it consistently with like intelligent, refined, um, nuanced uh, Russian forwards who bring a ton to the equation. Yeah, like, like for instance, Alexander Rykov as well from the Carolina Hurricanes, a player who was a really intelligent, refined two-way winger in his draft year, but fell all the way down to the what the fourth or fifth round of the draft. Fourth round, hundredth overall. Fourth, yeah, exactly. And uh, as a D plus one, he was among the the better U twenty one players in the entire VHL. Uh, came in just under a point a game last season in. In that league, a player who, in my opinion, projects as a really solid and versatile middle six piece long term, but just a, a profile that was undervalued. Also, Nikita Artemanov went down into the, the, the mid to late second round uh, in the draft just a, just a month ago, and Carolina nabbed him as well. They've been uh, making a real trend of uh, just swinging on the skilled, projectable, um, refined Russian players that are, are being uh, valued under market value or what 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 should be market value in terms yep. of purely on ice results. So uh, yeah, definitely a market that, that, that is going undervalued and a lot of, of uh, like gems to be found in the Russian market as a result of that, um, especially with NHL teams uh, not fully learning from, from their COVID seasons and uh, trusting video scouting to do the work with the Russian players and perhaps being content with writing them off rather than uh, getting live viewings or, or relying on video too heavily. Absolutely. And if you want to laugh, uh, six of uh, Carolina's 10 selections in the 2024 NHL draft were Russians, um, including all four of their final selections in the draft. They went with Timur Cole, Roman Shochrin, Fyodor Avramov with their before last selection of the draft, ridiculous value, and Andre Krutov to close things off. They love their Russians. Uh, sometimes it feels like they have no other scouts. Like it's just <laughs> Russia all the time, but it works. Like it's it's a it's an undervalued market, and teams should bank in on that. But that's our episode done. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, remember to like and subscribe. Leave us a comment letting us know what you want us to talk about next. And if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, please leave us a rate and review, and make sure to make us your first listen of the day. For a second listen of the day. Please check out Locked On Sports today. They've got all your news and updates about what's going on around sports on YouTube's first 24-7 news channel. And make sure to tune in for our next shows as we continue our prospects coverage for the month of July. This has been Hattie Kalakash, Director of North American Scouting, and Sebastian High, Director of European Scouting, both for Dauber Prospects. And we hope you tune in next time.